And thank you all for being here. I, I, I start by apologizing for all of you who are expecting the uh, lovely and talented Allison Camerata. She's been uh, waylaid by the vagaries of air traffic control, so I will have to step in for my friend here in a, in a uh, poor substitute. Uh, we have a great guest, though. Senator Chris Coons is in his... Uh, Democratic senator from Delaware. He was elected in 2010 in a special election, won election to a full term in 2014, which was a very tough year for Democrats. He won 55% of the vote. He is a member of the Appropriations Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee, and the Select Committee on Ethics. And for those of you who heard him in the opening session, he is a man of considerable optimism that the Senate which now sometimes resembles a taping of the Jerry Springer show, um, if not an outtake for Mad Max Fury Road. We, we don't um, throw as many yeah, chairs. Yes, yeah, you don't throw quite as many chairs. Uh, that the Senate can work better and actually has some very tangible ideas and, and some experience uh, in the economic sphere of working across uh, party lines. And we're going to get to all of those in a minute. But right now, it feels that we are pretty much as far as you can go in the other side of the spectrum when you look at not only the substance, but the process of, of the health care legislation, which could come to a floor this week. This is a bill where there have been no committee hearings, no committee markup, literally, I believe, no consultation with Democrats, no consultation with any of the constituency groups, and yet it has a fighting chance to pass on the Senate floor That's this right. week. How has the Senate gotten to the point where the process can be short-circuited to that extent? Great question. Um, let me just start by thanking all of you, uh, thanking the Aspen Institute, not just uh, for the opportunity that I had to be a Rodell Fellow, uh, Bill Budinger is an old dear friend uh, from his days in Delaware, but also for what Dan Glickman brings uh, to Congress through the congressional program, uh, which is regular conversations on a bipartisan basis about difficult subjects. Uh, there's no more divisive subject in the Capitol and the Congress right now uh, than health care. Um, over the last seven years, uh, Republicans have repeatedly repealed the Affordable Care Act in the House. Um, only to have uh, President Obama or the Senate uh, block its repeal. Uh, this week in the Senate, uh, we will finally see whether or not there is a Republican plan to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act uh, that can command 50 votes, and then it'll go back to the House, uh, and if it succeeds there, it'll go to the President. Um, I agree with your characterization. Uh, this was a highly um, secretive process. Um, I didn't get to see any of the text, nor did any other Democrat, uh, nor did many Republicans uh, until it was released late last week. Uh, we don't have a CBO score yet, so we don't yet know its full impact on Medicaid and on how many people may lose access to health care, uh, but we will be voting on it this week. Uh, because of the unusual process that's being used, uh, which is so-called reconciliation under budget instructions, I'll say in the same process that was used by Democrats to pass it uh, back uh, in 2009. Not on initial passage. Final Not on passage. initial passage, but final passage. Thank you. Um, there will be unlimited amendments. And it's not yet clear what process uh, we will follow. Uh, my hope is that my caucus will choose not to put out 30 or 50 amendments and stay up all night and show that we can resist, uh, but to put out three or four amendments that are simple and clear, that lay out what we think are shared principles in terms of access to health care, and have up or down votes on them on the floor, and give a sharp contrast and move ahead one way or the other. Do you, what, will happen, what do you think will happen this week? Will they pass the bill? I would never count out uh, Majority Leader mm -hmm. McConnell. Uh, he's a very skilled uh, legislative leader, and my gut is he'll end up finding a way to corral the votes. He has a very difficult field because you've got four announced conservative opponents, but who are open to negotiation, uh, and one publicly announced uh, more moderate opponent, uh, but several others who have grave concerns. This end wants deeper cuts to Medicaid uh, and deeper cuts uh, to the consumer guarantees of the Affordable Care Act and repeal of taxes. This end wants more retained in terms of funding for treatment for opioids and heroin addiction, um, mm. more of the retention of the Medicaid expansion, uh, and less of a sharp impact in terms of access to health care. Um, hitting that middle and retaining just 50 votes is going to be a very tough act. My gut is that McConnell wins from his perspective either way. It's either up or down vote, and he succeeds in one of the Republicans' major objectives, repeal the ACA. Or you put it on the floor and it fails, and right after July, uh, after the 4th of July break, we come right back in, and he uses that same vehicle for tax cuts. We'll come, let's talk about that for one moment as well. But let me ask you this. If this succeeds, mm -hmm. you, talk, you talked earlier, and we're going to talk more in a minute, about ways in which the Senate can work together. Right. If this succeeds, do you think it will change the Senate permanently? Um, nothing will change the Senate permanently <laughs> unless we let it. Um, I think it's my job 
to keep trying relentlessly to find areas of common ground, even with folks where I deeply and bitterly disagree over our approach to healthcare. But I think what the folks at Delaware pay me to do is to find common ground and to keep moving forward. So Dr. Bill Cassidy, conservative mm -hmm. Republican physician from Louisiana. Um, we've got an end of life care bill that we've introduced that we've worked hard on together. We've got other co-sponsors. Uh, it's been endorsed by the Right to Life Committee. This was in the past Congress. Uh, and it's been endorsed by organizations that typically are more on, on my side on healthcare issues. Um, that'll get virtually no coverage. At the top level, in terms of taxes and spending, uh, health care and education, what are our spending priorities, national security, the divisions between Republicans and Democrats are pretty stark and fairly enduring, at least over the seven mm -hmm. years that I've been there. But we keep finding issues to move forward on, and manufacturing and innovation yeah. is one of them. Um, and I, there, are, there are a handful of senators, both sides, who get that our job is to work together to solve real problems facing the country. And we'll talk about all of those in a moment, but is, it, is, is, is the dichotomy, though, you're setting up that it's possible to work on discrete, often technical areas, mm -hmm. but on the big value judgments that it's, you know, the big kind of statements of values, mm -hmm. do we value tax cuts or Medicaid? Yes. Uh, do we value uh, uh, public schools or uh, moving Title I into, into uh, uh, private school vouchers. Uh, those areas, do you think that, that endemic conflict is basically where we are and what, what we have to look forward to? Well, look, the, the, way, the way you build a big project or a big partnership is with small steps first. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see how we can get past this area of division and partisanship without starting. Um, and you start by finding bills you can agree on and bills you can pass and bills that don't have embedded strong opposition from both parties. Um, I think the average American uh, gave every elected official a big, meaty middle finger in the 2016 election. I think they're pissed. I think they don't like us. I think they don't trust us. And I think any member of Congress who doesn't get that isn't watching this show. Mm -hmm. um, why they're ticked off, why they're unhappy with us, why they don't trust us, there's a lot of different um, both analyses and potential solutions. But we've got too many members of Congress who think we can just keep doing things the way we've been doing them. And as a result, I think we're going to keep grinding down. Um, even in as partisan event as the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner in Delaware, which is the kind of you know, red meat based crowd, when I talk about doing bills with Marco Rubio or Tom Cotton, I get a standing ovation. So I don't know about other states. I, I don't know how what other if, senators get to this point. But what I hear from my state, from independents, Republicans, and Democrats, is work across the aisle, find ways to solve problems, and keep at it. What if you framed it as working with Donald Trump? Donald how, Trump's how would, got to sign these would, things for would, them to become law. How would that be received at the Jefferson Jackson dinner? You know what? If I said we were getting an infrastructure bill done that was going to put people to work, great. If it's a bill that's going to help save medium and small manufacturing jobs in Delaware, great. I mean, yes, there's, a, there's absolutely a faction of my party that wants to oppose Donald Trump on absolutely everything. But bluntly, the message from the middle of our mm -hmm. country is stop fighting with each other all the time. We didn't vote for Donald Trump because we think he's some fantastic, brilliant, great second coming. We just didn't like Hillary. And we want you guys to figure it out and you move us forward. That's what I hear when I sit down and listen to people in coffee shops and diners and union halls and fire companies. I, I want to come back to that, but let's, let's, let me ask you this. Where have you found the most ability to work with Republicans? What, on, and, and there's a whole series of manufacturing yep. research what, what, where have you found the most and why? And why have those been more amenable than some of these bigger polarizing issues? Great question. For me personally, uh, it's actually been on Africa and foreign aid issues. Um, part of that is a personal interest and I was the Africa subcommittee chairman for four years. And there's a lot of Republicans who have personal experience with the US-Africa relationship and with foreign aid, either from their own faith experience and perspective before being in service or because it's something they've been engaged in. It's an area that has managed to avoid divisive partisanship. We actually got five bills introduced through and signed into law in the last Congress that relate to foreign aid, relate to the US-Africa trade relationship, uh, relate to global health and, and food security. Uh, so it's been a very a fruitful area for legislation. Manufacturing, it's because it's where I spent my business career. I spent eight years with a highly innovative manufacturing company in Delaware, uh, and I deeply believe in its importance to our being a competitive um, economy and society and to our having a path forward 
for some middle class. Manufacturing is what built the middle class in Delaware, at least. And without advanced manufacturing, I don't see how we answer the yawning need for high-tech, high-skilled, high-paying jobs in this country in the coming decade. Manufacturing jobs are continuing to decline, even though output has been steady or rising. Uh, right? It's about 12. I disagree. Manufacturing, uh, manufacturing employment as a share of the total employment in the society is going down. We've as grown we go 900,000 manufacturing jobs over the last five years. Yeah, over the last. As a percentage of GDP, it has gone down. Right. Uh, um, is it, is, uh, talk about why you view manufacturing as central to preserving the middle class, as opposed to, say, something like services, which, which currently does employ more people than manufacturing. And services has grown rapidly in my state. Anyone who's got a credit card, thank you mm, very much. Yes. It was probably issued in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, but I grew up in a community where DuPont was the single largest employer, and we had a steel mill, we had an oil refinery, and we had two auto plants. And that sort of defined the middle class of the community I grew up in. Um, the company I worked for had manufacturing facilities in the United States and predominantly in Germany. And Germany has higher environmental protections, higher union mm -hmm. protections, mm -hmm. higher wages than the United States, yet roughly twice the percentage of GDP in manufacturing. There's a complex series of reasons why they've been successful in that. Um, but a, a, a study group led uh, by the former CEO of Dow Chemical, Andy Liveris, and the former mm -hmm. head of MIT, came up with a manufacturing hub strategy for us five years ago that intentionally copies one of the things that Germany has done. They've got things about how they do apprenticeship, how they do skills training, how they do higher education and craft, and they've got things about how they connect basic R&D with applied R&D with major manufacturers, with venture capital and skills and startups that has succeeded for them. We, five years ago, had zero hubs. Mm -hmm. Today, we've got 15 of them in everything from wideband gap semiconductors in North Carolina to additive manufacturing in Youngstown, Ohio, to now biomanufacturing in Newark, Delaware. I think these are very promising centers to really bring together our private sector, public investment in R&D, and growing new technologies where we can win in the next decade. We heard uh, from, uh, I think, the opening session before you, a prediction that half of all cars could be self-driving in a decade, Im implications for employment. You kind of take that over into the manufacturing side. The question becomes, even if you can revitalize manufacturing sure. and, and revitalize output, right. can you revitalize the employment? Can, can manufacturing s contribute significantly to the, to the gains of employment? You know the BLS, when they do their 10-year projections, right. anticipated continuing to contract as a share of the total job market. I refuse to accept that for the 900,000 jobs that are currently vacant in manufacturing, there isn't value in fighting for mm. 900,000 Americans to have those jobs. And I frankly don't believe that half of all cars are gonna be self-driving in 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I was part of a group at the company I worked for 15 years ago where we were working on fuel cells and every one of us believed we were gonna right. be driving a fuel right. cell car in right. five years. Right. I just test drove one last week. Mm. It's a demo. <laughs> It's early stage, it's coming in 10 more years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bluntly, if we're not a country that invents things and grows things and makes things, I have a hard time believing that we're gonna have the diversity of opportunity for our people that we need. There is a big longer term problem for us to confront in terms of the reshaping of work itself. And yes, autonomous vehicles could ultimately put out of work 3 million Americans who today drive a vehicle for a job. I think that will happen gradually over 25 years, and we need to be looking at it. And yes, we're not gonna go back. We're not gonna create 10 million manufacturing jobs. But for the 12 million manufacturing jobs we've got today, we should be fighting hard to save them, and for the opportunity for us to grow productivity and output and some manufacturing jobs that'll be higher skill and higher wage, why seed this ground? So what are, you know, the, the how would you describe the president? The president certainly talked about it. He went into manufacturing towns. Yep. He got a lot of support in the yep. Gary, Indiana's, and Youngstown's yep. of the world. Um, what would you describe as his strategy for reviving manufacturing, and how does it compare to your vision of what the federal government could be doing to promote Now, a this revival? is the less bipartisan part of the show. Yeah. <laughs> I have no earthly idea what his manufacturing strategy is. And I, I will tell you, with some real disappointment, um, early on after his election, I reached out to folks who represented the Trump campaign in Delaware or who were part of the transition team in Washington or in their confirmation hearings, the folks who are now leading the relevant agencies, and said, this is a great idea. Let's work together on manufacturing. To my puzzlement, 
um, the Manufacturing USA strategy I just talked about, that's a lot's been invested in it. It's been rolled out. These things are in launch phase is dramatically cut in the president's budget. All the Department of Energy manufacturing hubs are defunded. NIST in the Department of Commerce, National Institute of Standards Ooh. and Technology, which is responsible for several of these hubs, significantly defunded. The most effective federal program with regards to small and medium manufacturers is the Manufacturing Ex Extension Partnership. If you've heard of Ag Extension, Ooh. it's the same thing for manufacturers. You get some folks who really know quality control, inventory management, value stream mapping, help you get certified for ISO, help you figure out where you need new capital investment. And they come to your small plant where you don't have Six Sigma black belts. You know, you're not a DuPont or a Dow. You're, you've got 50 guys in a metalworking shop in Bridgeville, Delaware. And the MEP comes and sits down with you, figures out your challenges, applies these techniques, and makes you more competitive. That program is zeroed out in the budget. I can't for the life of me figure out why a pro-manufacturing administration and president would want to eliminate a program that has had such a positive impact on export-ready manufacturing over the last 20 years. If we, would, if, if we were asking them what their strategy would be, one thing they would certainly say is the president calling up companies yeah. and jawboning them when they announce they're moving That's investment right. Overseas, you know, I try to imagine Barack Obama doing this, and the and successfully Tom, Tom Donahue's head exploding right. at the Chamber of Commerce. Right. But by and large, I think the business community has said, "Look, if this is the price for deregulation and corporate tax cuts, that's right. I'm willing to accept it." What What is your view, especially as you look at what's happening now with Carry and others? Is that can that be an effective strategy? Just kind of shaming companies one by one every time they open a factory in. Mexico or China in the case of Ford? I, mean, I just don't think that's successful at scale. Um, it can produce, uh, you know, visible winnings um, briefly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but if you look at what's happening with Carrier, if you don't reform, and, and to give, you're right, I should be more um, gracious about saying regulatory reform and corporate tax rate reduction are central mm -hmm. to the administration's agenda. Um, those are important um, for retaining manufacturing and making it competitive in the United States. But combining that with a strategy of simply publicly shaming a handful of companies um, isn't gonna make corporate leaders rethink their financial strategy. Um, being afraid of the president sicking his Twitter followers on you um, isn't a very compelling thing to then say in your next stock call or at your next quarterly um, profit update. Uh, I, I just don't see how that works the, as the a strategy. Uh, the other piece, the other arrow in their quiver obviously is reassessing trade walking away from the TPP, uh, renegotiating NAFTA. You mentioned Germany, you know, yep. browbeating Angela Merkel. Is yep. You know, Germany is taking Canada. advantage yep. of us. Is a open trade system and a, free tra and, and a bias toward free trade agreements, is, is, is that incompatible with a thriving manufacturing center? Do you have to be protectionist to have a vibrant manufacturing center sector uh, in the um, U.S.? Frankly, to have a vibrant manufacturing sector, you have to have access to open markets around the world. Um, you can debate whether or not we got fair trade out of things like NAFTA, out of agreements. Um, I don't think there's any doubt or any disagreement that we should be tougher, stronger, and more dedicated um, to protecting American intellectual property and to vigorously enforcing the trade agreements we've got, um, particularly the U.S.-China relationship. Um, every conversation, it ends up, the fact that we're getting RIP stolen widely mm -hmm has ended up getting pushed down the agenda relative to geopolitical concerns. With North Korea top of that agenda, I think that's going to happen yet again. We have to have an export growth economy in order for manufacturing to survive in this One country. One quarter of manufacturing jobs tied to exports, correct? Yeah. And look, the administration may try now to rapidly negotiate bilateral treaties uh, in the Asia Pacific and in uh, the North Atlantic in order to make up for um, treaties that were worked on for years mm -hmm. and close to finish. I doubt that they can get them done as quickly and as decisively as we need. We need to knock down trade barriers in other parts of the world for us to get access to those markets. You know, you also obviously, are, you, you spend a lot of time on foreign affairs. You've been in Asia recently. When you look at both the economic and diplomatic impact, was it a mistake to abandon the TPP? Um, the impact of our withdrawal from TPP in the Asia Pacific was seismic. Uh, I just spent uh, time in Vietnam and Singapore with John McCain and John Barrasso two Republican senators you may be familiar with, um, and in a whole series of bilateral meetings with long-standing close American allies, 
uh, and with regional players who are trying to decide their alignment. It, it was uniformly um, deeply puzzling to them. Uh, either left close, long allies concluding that the United States uh, doesn't know its future path and is receding from leadership, um, or in other cases that they ought to get busy accommodating Chinese concerns and demands because, frankly, in the face of uh, Chinese advocacy, a new infrastructure mm. bank, a new one belt, one road strategy, and a pervasive presence in their economies and their politics that we just can't be relied on anymore. We've got, I think, a counter story to that, um, but we need to engage, and you're we need to engage, engage strongly. You're making a case almost no national Democrat makes anymore. Most of the Democratic mayors supported TPP, but very few Democratic senators spoke out in, front of, uh, in favor of it. You had a, you had a uh, presidential campaign in which both candidates were deeply skeptical of it, and NAFTA, uh, you know, after uh, Bill Clinton's NAFTA, because we have to, uh, back in 1993. Um, is it a mistake for the Democratic Party to abandon the defense of a more open international trading system, particularly with Trump leading the Republican Party into so much skepticism of it? Um, our challenge is to help Americans understand the difference between the impacts of globalization and the impacts of trade agreements. Um, there is widespread skepticism in both caucuses about trade agreements and their benefits mm. going forward. It is a tougher case to make. But this is happening at the same time that there is vigorous questioning, both in terms of the budget and public statements by the administration and the president, about whether or not we are the indispensable, war, the indispensable country in the world. I would argue to my boss in Delaware, mm -hmm. the people, the citizens of Delaware, that over the last 70 years, what we've accomplished is the creation of a world order, a set of rules, where we've become safer and more prosperous as a result. The rest of the world, our key allies in Japan and South mm. Korea and Germany and NATO, they don't owe us payments for providing their security. We didn't do this out of charity. We did this because stable, multi-party democracies that are also capitalist societies are our best allies. Countries that share our values and that share this approach towards the rules-based world order that we mm. built starting 70 years ago are the best guarantors of our security and our prosperity. The idea that we can long be prosperous and safe if we withdraw from the world, and if we withdraw both in terms of trade and in terms of uh, our alliances and our partnerships, I, I think it's just foolish one and measure, ahistorical. One measure of that global integration, almost, almost every company that builds something in the US, that manufactures something right. in the US, is, is, is manufacturing it at the apex of a global supply chain. Right. Uh, you know, Peter Navarro, uh, Trump's uh, you know, White House trade advisor told the Financial Times earlier this year, our goal is to unwind the global supply chain. Uh, at, on the other side, you have people who say, look, we could not defend, we could not protect those manufacturing jobs in the US unless some of the pieces were assembled along the way in lower cost uh, Mexico or China or wherever. Where do you come down? What, what is the role of the global supply chain at this point? Is it, is it a positive? Is it a negative? Do we want American companies to manufacture more of the, the guts of what they produce Absolutely. inside the US? Absolutely. Um, I don't know how many of you have got a smartphone, um, but if you think about how much of the guts of that device in the last 10 years were invented and developed here, the vast mm. majority. How many of them are manufactured here? None. Um, I have a bipartisan bill yeah. um, that I've just introduced with a Republican colleague to increase the amount of the R&D credit that you get if you manufacture here something that you've invented here and another bill around the 199 credit with a different Republican co-sponsor to incentivize bringing the supply chain into the United States. Our tax incentives run exactly the wrong way. And as a corporate leader, you're frankly making bad financial decisions if you aren't looking hard at other economies as the places to do some of your manufacturing and assembling. We need to realign our tax incentives so that they pull employment into the United States and they defend investment in manufacturing here. That ought to be part of tax reform. My concern is that right after this health care fight this week, we're going to move towards a one-sided, one-party only tax cut discussion mm -hmm. rather than addressing tax reform that will actually sustain good jobs in the United States. Let's get tax reform in a minute. But can I ask you, that's a carrot. That's a carrot to encourage companies to move more of the supply chain in the U.S. Let me ask you about a stick. Yeah. In the 1980s, uh, Walter Mondale in 1984 ran on a domestic content proposal requiring that X percent of every car sold in the U.S. had to be built in the U.S. The House passed it. Uh, they, the House passed it after 1984. It didn't go anywhere in the Senate, but part of what came out of that was the sticker 
on your car window when you buy it that tells you what percent of your car was manufactured in North America. I believe it's right. North America wide. Yeah. Should we have that sticker on our iPhone? Should we have that sticker on our TV? Would that change corporate behavior if every product sold in the US, you knew how much of it was made in the US? It couldn't hurt. Um, I'll say this, that there are popular TV segments on the national news, uh, on different uh, cable shows that highlight Made in America products because there's a lot of Americans who are willing to spend a little bit more for something that's made in this country. My recollection is that we all got handed bags at the beginning of the Aspen Ideas mm. Festival where some effort was made to secure a product that was made in the United States by veterans. The marginal cost to us, mm -hmm. pretty minor. Mm -hmm. But a willingness to make it an additional investment for things made in the United States, I think it is much broader. One of the things that puzzled me about the new pipelines that have been approved by the administration is the failure to insist on US steel as the source material for these new pipelines. There's a lot we can do with federal buying power to incentivize the purchase of American made and American built. You mentioned tax reform. And that process is unfolding to this point pretty much the same way as healthcare. I talked to Ron Wyden a couple weeks ago, you know, the ranking Democrat on Finance Committee. He's had no conversations. I mean, they had one all Senate meeting uh, in, in the White House, but nothing uh, serious. Uh, a plan of doing it through the reconciliation process, which only requires 50 votes, no involvement of Democrats, not clear what kind of hearings or committee process there will be. What are you expecting out of tax reform? What am I hoping for? What are you expecting? What am I expecting? Um, sadly, I'm expecting at the end of the day that it will be a fairly uh, limited menu of tax cuts that are not paid for uh, and that are rushed through in a fairly one-sided process. And do you expect they will try to, you know, right now, this gets a little in the weeds, but if you use the special reconciliation process, you cannot increase the deficit okay. for more than 10 years, which is why the Bush tax cuts had to expire and Obama was able to, in the fiscal cliff, raise the top rate again. There is talk that the Senate and, and the Senate Republicans will try to blow that up and extend the window and allow you to have either longer or open-ended uh, revenue-losing tax cuts. Do you expect that? Do you expect they will try that? That may well happen. Yeah. Um, that, that'd be an unfortunate abandonment of um, any discussion about fiscal responsibility and paying for tax cuts. I understand the view of some that tax cuts are always good. They always pay for themselves. Um, I think recent history demonstrates otherwise. So when we go to these process questions, I mean, it, it, kind of, it really does go to this larger question. I mean, you, there are a lot of, you know, Democrats during the George W. Bush administration, during the George H. W. Bush administration. I covered the Ronald Reagan administration. There were lots of Democrats who disagreed with them on policy, there, just as there are lots of Democrats who now disagree with President Trump on pretty much everything that he is trying to do. But they feel that he is somehow qualitatively different. He's not just a, a, a um, uh, an opponent or a difference on policy that when you look at the way he talks about the judiciary, so-called judges, fake news media, the tweeting about uh, you know, th threatening, uh, ostensibly threatening James Comey about tapes, that he is something more. He is kind of a threat to the way the norms that we have, the checks and balances that guide our democracy. Do you view him as something different than a typical policy disagreement that Democrats and Republicans have grappled over? Look, uh, President Trump was the most unconventional candidate uh, of my lifetime. Um, certainly the most unexpected in terms of uh, the way he conducted his campaign um, and the way he connected with voters and the way he ultimately was successful in the campaign. Um, and, and I think um, he says and does things that really are testing the foundations of our democracy. Um, so far, I am encouraged that we've got federal judges who are standing up to, for example, uh, what I view as an unconstitutional Muslim ban. People can disagree, but where there have been federal court rulings, they've been respected and enforced. Um, journalists who question and criticize this president, who might be themselves then criticized or the briefings closed down or marginalized, but where um, there haven't been uh, prosecutions or uh, direct challenges to the freedom of the press. Um, I think we're at a very important and difficult moment in the life of our republic. Um, and it requires people of good faith of both parties um, to stand up for institutions that have been central to our democracy um, and to insist on pursuing to its end an investigation of what happened in 2016 and making responsible investments to ensure that 2018 and 2020, Ooh. we don't see a repeat. Of all the things former FBI Director Jim Comey said in his testimony, the one I hope was heard most broadly was that Vladimir Putin's determination to influence our 2016 election was largely successful, and we can fully expect them to come back and do it again be in back. 2018, 
or 2020, unless strong action is taken to brush them back. Just last week, by a vote of 98 to 2, the Senate voted for tough Russia sanctions, both blocking the president's power to waive some of the existing sanctions and giving him new tools to be more active and aggressive with Russia in sanctions. That was a strong bipartisan moment and a fairly clear signal to the president that we all want to defend our democracy. You know, in temperament and style and precision, Mitch McConnell is as far from Donald Trump as you yes, could get. Yes. But yet, over the past year, he has run a blockade on a Supreme Court nomination that we've never seen before. Yep. He has engineered a process on the health care bill, which Donald Ritchie, the retired uh, Senate historian, said is unlike any we have seen in at least a century yep. since you know, the days probably of Nelson Aldridge, uh, yep. you know, 100 years ago. Uh, and now you have the potential of a, of a rec breaking the reconciliation process to advance a tax cut. You said Donald Trump is testing kind of the, the, the fiber of our checks and balances in our democracy. Would you say the same thing about the Senate Majority Leader? Um, I'd say that for someone who is an institutionalist um, and who yearns for regular order and yearns for the institution that he grew up in, um, these are really striking actions, um, the two that you detailed. Um, denying a hearing or a vote for a legitimate, qualified nominee to the Supreme Court for nearly a year is the most partisan filibuster of a Supreme Court nominee in our history. Um, and this process for producing a health care bill um, does significantly further degrade trust between the parties about how we're going to address fundamental issues. Democrats are not without fault. Mm -hmm. There are things we also have done that rushed through or step, sidestep traditional processes. Um, but each time we take another big step down, and these are big steps down being taken now, um, the level of obstruction against Obama in terms of his nominees and legislation, and now um, the degree of determination to rush to a result um, is genuinely harming it's the sort of like if you pull the rubber band on one side and you pull it back on the other. I mean, yeah. it doesn't, it's going to snap. Yeah. So, you know, part of this that strikes me is that, uh, you know, the country is pretty closely balanced. I mean, it's pretty close to, a, Democrats have won the popular vote in right. six of the last seven presidential elections, but they have only held the House six of the past 26 years. I mean, there's a lot of pretty close balance back and forth. Right. And yet here we are seeing uh, almost a comp with a pretty narrow majority, and of course in Donald Trump's case he won 46 percent, an effort to completely undo many of the things that President Obama did. We've talked about healthcare. We haven't talked about Paris and climate, but the same kind of thing. If Democrats win in 2021, if they win unified control, do we simply, because all of these, uh, the, the, the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Treaty goes into effect three days after the next election. The Medicaid undoing, even if it passes, is going to be backloaded into the 2020s. Is this our future? Just a narrow tip of the pendulum to one side or the other, and we, complete, we just kind of go through this endless fighting, it's almost like World War I, fighting over the same terrain back and forth, without Wonder Woman, back and forth um, uh, over you know, the same few feet of ground. I hope not, Ron, because generational trench warfare uh, is a pretty grim picture for American democracy. If there's one thing I hear from business mm -hmm. leaders, from manufacturers, um, who I want to see employ more Americans, it's that they need some predictability. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we're careening back and forth you know, to a high-tax, high-regulatory environment, to a low-tax, low-regulatory environment, to an environment where we are moving towards a cleaner energy economy, to one where you know, all the stops are undone and we're no longer going to regulate or uh, have an EPA that's effective, just to pick two examples yeah. you just referenced. Um, that's not good for our economy. It's not good for our politics. I do think part of the reason for the very sharp partisanship and the close contest of the last decade is rooted in the fact that control has changed yes. so many times. Yes. So that means that the majority leader and minority leader in both houses, but more in the Senate than the House, um, are just a few months and the mm. next election away from being back in control. But if if you, if you have one shot at House, Senate, President, and then a decade later another shot, and then a decade later another shot, um, there ought to be a common framework of what it is we're committed to and where we're going. What is unusual about this president is a budget that shreds what has been a bipartisan commitment for two generations. Investment in federal research, NIH, CDC, FDA. We're not talking 3% or 5% cuts. These aren't efficiency trims. This isn't finding ways to be a little more lean 
if you're doing 20 and 30 percent cuts of these organizations, mm. you're talking about dramatic reductions in our shared investment uh, in finding cures and treatments and solutions to our healthcare future. Um, I could give you a dozen yeah. other examples, but those are probably you know, the most prominent ones. And the reason I say that the Senate may be great again as a result of the president is that we just passed a strong bipartisan budget where instead of the president's request for deep cuts to NIH, we added funding. And I think you'll see the same thing happen in this budget cycle. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, I mean, I, I, I've talked to utility. Utilities have to build power plants that years. have a life of 40, 45 years. And if you say to them, okay, the president now has, was, you know, is in the process of undoing the Obama Clean Power Plan to reduce carbon emissions, and the process of withdrawing from uh, uh, Paris, do you believe that in 15 or 20 years, the power plants you build today will have no constraint on carbon? Do you believe this is a sustainable course? Or that somewhere down the road, eventually, you are, in fact, going to have to be accountable for the amount of carbon that you emit? And I think most of them would say, yep. absolutely. So it becomes this kind of like oscillating where it, it seems entirely possible that if the Democrats win unified control of government again in 2021, that they undo whatever undoing the Republicans are able to accomplish in these next few years. Well, Ron, you know, my hope is that some of us who may serve through yeah. that whole period, if there be any, um, will remember not to overreach mm -hmm. um, and to consult with folks from the other party who are willing to work with us and to find solutions that are sustainable. Um, a sixth of our economy is health care. Yeah. A whole lot of our care and concern and what matters to the people we represent is health care. Um, the fact that the Affordable Care Act never attracted Republican support and that we didn't step forward as Democrats and address the problems with it and legislatively fix them, some would say because Republicans weren't willing to, um, that's what's made it such a pendulum swing. There was lots of opposition to Medicare and Medicaid when they first passed. Mm -hmm. yes. There were also lots of subsequent bills to fix them, to refine them, to mm -hmm. strengthen them. Today, they've got broad bipartisan support across yeah. the country. Right. Today, the ACA enjoys 55% support. So my gut hunch is that if Republicans genuinely scrape the ACA consumer protections, which you know, we don't know yet if they will, if the pre-existing condition protection, the lifetime caps protection uh, goes away, uh, I suspect there'll be millions of Americans upset and engaged and saying, hang on a minute, we want that back. That may happen at the state level. That may at some point in the future happen to the federal How about level. the Medicaid cuts? But a broader conversation about how we afford Medicaid in the long term mm -hmm. and how we afford access to quality health care for the disabled, for children, and for seniors, that's something that's inevitable. We are going to have to confront this, not just this week, not just this year, but for the decades coming. Because the drivers in our demographics are unavoidable. And if we don't find a mechanism for figuring out how to pay for high quality health care, while keeping the annual increase in costs manageable, we're not going to have a budget that we can afford. You know, if you asked people last fall uh, what Donald Trump would do to make their economic lives better, they could probably answer. Cut taxes, cut regulation, America first and trade infrastructure. Yeah. Um, Hillary Clinton had a lot of individual proposals, uh, ideas about helping you balance work and life, paid family leave, universal pre-K, free college, college tuition. Costs, but on the kind of core question of what would create, what would make the economy create more jobs and cause my income to rise faster, mm -hmm. I think many people saw kind of the hole in the donut. Is there a clear democratic alternative to the Trump vision of less taxes, less regulation, less openness to the world on immigration and trade? Um, the Democratic caucus in the Senate um, is about to roll out. It's um, here's what we're going to do um, for the American middle class to fight for prosperity, to create better opportunity. Uh, I'm not going to preview it here, because mm -hmm. I've been expressly told not to. <laughs> um, and, and Anybody in the room going to tell? None of us will tell, right? We're all it's televised. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's overdue. I think the fact that we've gone six months without an affirmative agenda from Democrats um, is a missed opportunity. You the, know, the end of the presidential campaign largely consisted of, have you looked at this guy? He's crazy and yeah. unqualified. That's not compelling. The average American says, OK, and what are you going to do for me? And we need a better answer than we've so far. You know, done. most Democrats would describe Republicans as the party of the rich. They nominated a guy with a gold bedroom and a billion dollars and, you know, three supermodel wives. And he won the highest share of yep. white voters without a college education right. of any presidential candidate since Ronald Reagan. He won 2,600 counties. He yep. won more counties than either candidate, any candidate in either party since Ronald Reagan. He dominated outside of 
the, I mean, Hillary Clinton won 88 of the 100 largest counties in America. He won 2,600 of the other 3,000. What has happened? The Democrats think of themselves as the party of the people. Why are so many, not minorities in the working class, Democrats do well, but whites in the working class outside of those core cities, many of which are thriving again, right. why are so many turning away for a candidate who was so much from the top of the, of the pyramid? Well, first, it's not impossible uh, for a Democratic candidate of means who comes from privilege and wealth to connect with and speak to and inspire um, America's working class and folks who are struggling. Look at FDR. Look at his background. I think the fact that um, FDR grew up with great privilege and opportunities but was humbled by polio, struggled um, to make of his life what he did mm -hmm. um, in recovery from that um, difficult disability, gave him a compassion for the struggle of average Americans that he was able to project and that they believed him. Look at JFK, born into wealth and privilege, but a person who both through his military service and through the way he called the better angels of America forward and spoke about his faith and connected with working Americans was really able to inspire them. It's not impossible for a Democrat of whatever background to engage and inspire working Americans. But they got the sense from us from how Democrats spoke about America, that we disrespect them, that we don't respect work, that we don't respect people who sacrifice and struggle and who've contributed to making America what it is. And there is a whole segment of our country that feels like they've been sliding sideways the last 20 years. Their incomes haven't gone up, their opportunities aren't better, they are the ones who have suffered worst, the opium, uh, excuse mm. me, the opioid and heroin epidemic across the country, their suicide rates are rising and their opportunities seem constrained, partly because of international competition and deindustrialization, partly because they don't have the education and skills of the modern economy. These are folks who feel like they're on the short end of the deals cut in Washington, of the opportunities of the global economy, of all the bright shining promise of innovation and of driverless cars mm -hmm. and UAVs. And we've got to hear that and we've got to connect with them. It is about economic opportunity, and it's hard to have good answers to that. But first, it's about respect. It's about actually responding to their concern. The, the part that fascinates me, and I think is, is the real challenge, you said Hillary Clinton won fewer than 500 counties, less than one-sixth of the counties in America. But her counties mm -hmm. account for two-thirds of the total GDP, according to the Brookings Institution. And the question is, is it possible for Democrats to have an agenda that speaks to those who feel left behind without stunting the places that are doing well, without trying to deny them either immigration or trade on which they are thriving? Do you have to, uh, do you have to kind of push back against the places that are doing well? Or is there an agenda that ultimately can find common purpose between the, the north side of Chicago sure. and the hinterlands in Illinois that feels that it is being totally left out? Sure. Um, I, I have to believe there is. Um, I think we have struggled to define and articulate it. Um, but on an issue like immigration, um, that when, when torqued is sharply divisive, um, it is an issue that we can talk about in ways that are more optimistic and more positive. 25% um, of Americans are either themselves immigrants or the children of immigrants. They are one generation or less away from being new Americans. And there are ways to talk about immigration as the thing that has made us diverse, creative, innovative, and successful in the world. Um, there are ways you can talk about immigration that inspire fear and anger and a sense of division. Uh, we've just seen an election where the latter was predominantly the case. Um, I think it is possible for us to put forward a vision that is more optimistic and constructive about that, that's not zero sum, but is instead uplifting. The United States has a long history of beating the odds through invention and innovation and by welcoming people from all around the world. I think a, a democratic approach that celebrates entrepreneurship and innovation and competitiveness, but also welcomes the best and brightest of the world is a winning message for us. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the brief that the technology industry filed against the Muslim executive order right. is a remarkably expansive statement, right. not, tech, not narrowly legally on exactly the case you just made. Let's bring in the audience for some questions. Right. Is there a microphone? Yes, we got one over the over there, there's a mic over there. Can you, there's a question over there, that side. Just maybe identify yourself. Hi, I'm Lauren Walters. I'm, I'm curious, Senator, uh, why you think it's 
been so hard for your colleagues, your Democratic colleagues, to stand up with a positive message for the last six months, whether it's on health care, on jobs, um, just to be beating on the president, beating on the negative message, as opposed to here's our vision for the future? Um, that's a great question, to which I don't have a great answer. Um, but I'll tell you, obviously, the, the election of President Trump was um, not just unexpected, it was a shock. Um, and, you know, in my, own, in my own family and in my own community, uh, there were a lot of folks who found the things that he said as a candidate um, so disagreeable that they expected him to be um, not just disqualified, but unelectable. Mm -hmm. That he could win um, has really challenged a sense of um, what are our core values as a country, and that's led to, I, I think, a sense of resistance and rage um, across a very broad um, spectrum within the Democratic Party. I, I never forget that Americans are optimistic people, um, that simply highlighting the negative and the failings and the shortcomings of somebody else isn't what's going to move us forward. Um, when I faced in 2010 an unconventional candidate in the general election. Who wasn't a witch. See? Yeah, just, just was not a I witch. I called her an unconventional candidate. That's as far as I'm going. My mom, who used to work in corporate HR, gave me a simple piece of advice. She said, your election is a hiring interview. You're asking the people of Delaware to hire you. You don't go into a job interview saying, look at this guy. He's an idiot. You don't want to hire him. He's a loser. No one's going to hire you for that. You go in and say, here's my vision. Here's my qualities. Here's what I would do to be a part of your team and move this company forward. And trust the American people. They see Donald Trump for his strengths and weaknesses. And if we don't have a better message, if we don't have a better way of inspiring and engaging the American people, then shame on us. So at the end of the day, I, you know, I can't speak for everybody else, but that's how I come at it. Did you take that out of the Georgia election? Was that also the, did the Georgia election also send that message to you? Yeah. Where, where there was a very kind of minimalist message from the yes. Democrat and just trying to basically ride the wave. Um, I, I don't know John Ossoff personally. Um, and I, I wasn't actively engaged in you know, helping with that campaign. My gut is that if you're going to run someone who doesn't live in the district, is 30 years old, and doesn't connect on a values level with a, a district um, that has been a conservative yeah. uh, district for a long time, you're going to have a hard time winning. Turnout both parties was very high. Motivation and engagement from Democrats around the country to send a strong signal of opposition uh, to the president was very high. And the investment, it was the all-time most expensive special election for a congressional seat in American history. But we're not going to defy or repeal the laws of political gravity. Folks go home to their base party and their base assumptions about the world. And my gut, and there's a piece in the New York Times about this yesterday I recommend to you. My gut is that if Mr. Ossoff had spoken a little Ooh. bit more about his values and about why he wanted to serve the district, and if he moved a couple of blocks, he might today be Congressman Austin. Uh, before you go to another question, I want to, I want to, I want to, before you, we'll get you, sir, in one second. How many of you live in a county that you think was close in this presidential election? Close. Co county was decided close. I mean, this is part of the challenge, right? 60% right. of us now live in counties that were decided by 20 points or more. Right. There were three of the 52 Republicans in the Senate in states that Hillary Clinton won. Right. Probably not a coincidence that two of them, Collins and Heller, are among those who are right. most at risk in the health care bill. Is the problem not just the elected officials, but that all of us are sorting out yes. in where we live and who we're Absol among? Absolutely. The, the fact that we are increasingly um, consuming news that confirms our bias and our interests, um, the fact that we're socializing with groups that are increasingly um, sorted into groups, uh, and the fact that we live in districts and in counties that are gerrymandered to be less competitive is a part of the dividing of America into two Americas. Um, I I'll ask you to think about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is typically the dinner in America where you've got this person in your extended family who's got these political mm -hmm. views, and mm -hmm. this person in your extended family who's got these political views, and they and fight cats ring. and dogs. And a nose ring. Yeah. And everybody else in the middle who just says, you know, could you pass the potatoes? <laughs> Isn't the, isn't the turkey great? This Thanksgiving, I had staff asking for advice and consulting on how do I even go? Mm -hmm. Almost everybody who works for me has family members who are dramatically opposite in their political values because our families have spread across the country to different counties yeah. and different communities. We have to figure out how to have that Thanksgiving dinner table conversation 
as an American family again. Yeah. It's hard, but we have to do it. Sir, in the, oh, look at that, wow. Hi, my name is Sean Casey. I want to have, ask a follow-up question on the values piece and try to concretize it a little bit. Ten of your colleagues in the Senate in the Democratic Party are running for re-election mm -hmm. in 2018 in states that Trump won. Mm -hmm. What advice concretely would you give them as they face not only the values question, but also the religious set of questions that you highlighted in your speech earlier this evening? So the good thing about the folks um, who I serve with who are Democrats who are running for re-election in states that Trump won um, is that every one of them is a good local candidate. They represent their state. Joe Donnelly is a Hoosier. He is... He ran a local manufacturing plant. He understands um, the needs and the concerns of the people of Indiana, and he doesn't hesitate. Um, well, no, I should say, broadly speaking, Democrats always hesitate to talk about their faith. Uh, it's, just, it's just not something as a party we're inclined to do. Um, but he is a very good person. Um, and if you, if you spend time with on the ground in their home state, Heidi Heidkamp or John Tester, is there anyone more Montana, my impression is, than John Tester or Joe Manchin? I can't imagine a better guy to go into a diner or a fire hall than Joe Manchin. Every one of these people was moved toward service by their values and their faith and can talk about it compellingly. Um, if I had any point of encouragement for them, it would be resist the temptation to have your election or re-election defined by this national fight point to the areas where you've been bipartisan and gotten things done, express a determination to reflect the values of your state, and a willingness to be contrarian and to go against your party when it's absolutely necessary to stand up for the people who represent, who elect you and to represent them. One of our problems as a Senate is that when we have fewer and fewer bills that we vote on, that are big bills, there's fewer and fewer votes mm. where it's possible for you as a you know, Claire McCaskill or a John Tester to distinguish yourself from the rest of our caucus and to show your home state that I'm standing for you, not for a national democratic party and its agenda. Um, and that's frankly been a challenge in the last two cycles because we've taken fewer and fewer votes and there's fewer and fewer amendments. I don't think we're protecting our vulnerable senators by having fewer votes. I think in the end we're putting them at risk by not allowing them to show how they differ from the caucus position. We have a question over here. Good evening. My name is Alfred Fuente. I have a question about the sanctions against Russia and whether the Senate has any intention to do anything beyond uh, the economic sanctions. Um, we Americans, we may not eat together, uh, we may not pray together, but we sure do vote together. And um, our electoral system was under attack in 2016, to which we've only offered symbolic sanctions. Um, given that Russia is a country that basically believes uh, might makes right, uh, do we as a country have more, uh, do we have other intentions beyond just economic sanctions? Are we going to invite Georgia and Azerbaijan to become part of NATO? Are we going to begin selling lethal arms to the Ukraine? We need to do something that's a little bit more expansive than just um, economic sanctions. And so that's my question, if we have uh, anything more in, in the pipeline um, to defend ourselves. Um, three things. So um, thanks for the question. First, I disagree that the sanctions just passed are purely yeah. symbolic. Um, but we've got two branches. We have an executive and a legislative. We've got two departments of the legislative. Even those have got to get through the House in the face of resistance from the administration. Then the administration has to actually carry them out. For us to change our position with regards to arming the, the Ukraine um, and moving for the admission to NATO uh, of other countries, I'll remind you, we just admitted Montenegro or we just ratified the admission of Montenegro to NATO, something that was so vigorously opposed by Russia that they tried to engineer a coup. It's a Ooh. tiny little country, but the, the, just the vigor of the resistance to NATO expansion from Putin is undeniable in that particular case, and the bipartisan action that was taken to signal a willingness to keep working with NATO in the face of that, I think, shouldn't be missed. Um, Senator Graham of South Carolina and others of us on the relevant subcommittee are pushing for more investment in things that will strengthen the hand of our Eastern European allies. Um, the more that we spend on countering Russian disinformation and propaganda by revitalizing investing in Radio Free Europe and Voice of America, for example, that's welcome, that's needed in the Balkans, in Poland, 
uh, in other Eastern European countries. We also need to strengthen and harden their electoral systems and ours. Right now, this may sound like pure defense, not offense to you, and I'll accept the point. Um, but we haven't done what we need to do to harden our electoral systems to ensure that we're not going to be victim to exactly the same kind of interference in 2018, but more successfully. Imagine the chaos we'd be in today if tens of millions of Americans didn't believe Donald Trump was legitimately president, believed that the Russians had actually manipulated the vote totals, and instead of winning by 150,000 votes across three states, he'd really lost. And imagine if we had a Democratic candidate who was still refusing to accept the outcome and was litigating it. That has happened in other countries. We can't let that happen. The common commitment to respect peaceably the outcome of elections is foundational to our democracy. And we have to take stronger action to help our Eastern European allies who are facing, I mean, do you think the mm. Russians interfered in the French election mm. and the German election? Absolutely. Mm. There is no mystery about this. Do you think Putin is, is determined to thwart our efforts to contain North Korea? He just publicly said last week, if China actually works with us to put the screws to North Korea, Russia will make up the difference. It's unthinkable that we aren't doing a better job, I'll agree with you, of coming together in a bipartisan way to stand up for our democracy and our allies. Not a facetious question. Why isn't the administration more concerned? I think many people, when Jeff Sessions, Attorney General, went before the Intelligence Committee, I think the, 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 the most jaw-dropping moment of the whole morning was no briefing. Yeah. He has never asked for a briefing yeah. on what Russia yeah. was doing. Why do you believe they are not more concerned? Is it, does, does the president view it as, a, as kind of a, a, intertwined with a kind of question of his legitimacy? Yes. Is there something more nefarious? Why aren't they more worried? Um, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. We don't know yet if there's fire at the core of this but there is smoke pouring out of the White House. Um, I am encouraged, I choose to be encouraged, um, that in Bob Mueller we have a strong, competent, independent special counsel who's getting the resources he needs to pursue this, and that the Senate Intelligence Committee, led by a Republican and Democrat who are working well together, is making progress, issuing subpoenas, and pursuing leads. I don't know, at the end of the day, why we've got a president and a national security leadership that doesn't see this for the very real threat it is. Um, but what I had feared would have happened by now, that some grand deal would be cut where either Ukraine would be sold down the river or our mm -hmm. NATO commitment compromised or um, Assad and Iran mm -hmm. bolstered, hasn't happened. And the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Advisor in their confirmation hearings all spoke fairly forcefully to seeing Putin as an adversary and seeing NATO as vital allies. And there has been some buttressing of our historic commitments in these fields. I, I think this is the most important national security question we have. Since the president has clearly floated the possibility in his Twitter uh, tweets, uh, how Just do you- think about that what, sentence. Right, what, <laughs> what, would, what do you believe your Senate Republican colleagues would do if he fired Bob Mueller? Um, there was a, um, there was a night recently where that was considered um, to be something the president was actively weighing. Uh, and I think he got a lot of input uh, from Republican yeah. colleagues saying, don't you dare. That's a very bad idea. Do you think they have, sent, they have drawn a line, you think? Um, my hope is that they have and that they've conveyed um, that taking that sort of an action uh, would be so outside the boundaries of our um, system um, that he would, he would face bracing pushback from Republicans in the Congress. Through the magic of email, we have Allison. We have a few thoughts from Allison Camerata. Because uh, I asked her what, what she would like to make sure we, would, we, we heard. And she had, she, uh, there's a several, but I want to I ask you one first. What was your favorite collaboration with a Republican? Where, was, where, where did you enjoy working with Republicans the most? And second, any change since the shooting of the House Republicans in Washington? Um, you know, the good news is it's hard to pick a favorite collaboration. Um, you know, some of them are just personally very satisfying. Senator Isaacson of Georgia has become a very good friend, and we've worked on a whole series of bills, um, and, and he's just, he's personally a delight to work with. Uh, his wife and my wife have gotten to be close, we've gotten to be close, and he's just a reasonable, thoughtful guy. We disagree, don't get me wrong. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's a right-wing conservative, but he's just, 
there's just something about working with him that's delightful. Jerry Moran is the co-chair of the Ooh. Competitiveness Caucus with me. Um, we've done a number of bills together. Senator Rubio and I have done five bills together across a very wide range of areas. Um, but in some ways, the ones I take the most delight in are the ones that are utterly unexpected. Tom Cotton and I introduced a bill on strengthening our patent system last week. Tom Cotton and I are pretty far apart. Ooh. Pat Roberts, the curmudgeonly 30-year veteran chairman of agriculture, very conservative, former Marine, eats Democrats for breakfast. We've done two bills together, and one of them's become law already. I mean, so I, I take a certain delight in um, unexpected partnerships with folks who initially were really unwilling to work with me. Um, on a long flight back uh, from uh, Southeast Asia with John McCain, um, I got the chance to talk to Dr. Barrasso, Senator Barrasso, who's number three in um, Senate Republican leadership. And he agreed to come on the bill, the end of life bill that I've got with Bill Cassidy. I've never gotten John Barrasso on a bill before. Mm. I take a real, a real joy in getting that done. How about the, the, the reaction to and the aftermath of the shooting? Um, you know, within, within the, the capital community, um, there was, um, there was shock and concern, and there was a lot of expressions of um, prayerful concern and, and affection and, and support. And uh, Jeff Flake is someone I've traveled Ooh. with and worked with and is a good friend, and um, he was right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and when he came onto the floor, he was surrounded by a dozen senators of both parties uh, when I saw his wife later that day. I mean, if not for the detail that was presence, yeah. Um, we, we would have had a very different outcome with all the yes. House members who were present and, and likely Senator Flake. And it was a, so it was a chastening moment that you sort of look at each other and say, huh. Um, in a broader context, it, it is hard um, because we were making progress on criminal justice reform on a bipartisan Ooh. basis that's now largely stopped. Um, there are neighborhoods in my hometown of Wilmington where shootings are a tragic daily reality and we're making progress on issues of, of fighting violent crime. We're just not making as much progress as I would have hoped. But within the capital community, um, this was a moment where we, we came closer and um, we cared for each other. Uh, the baseball game went ahead. Uh, a good question is why are we still having a baseball yeah. game that's Republicans versus Democrats? Mm. Why can't we make it, you know, evens and odds? Well, shirts and skins is probably a bad well, of course, idea. But, of course, the women, the, why, the, why, the why can't we the, mix it up? The women in Congress do the politicians against the media. Yes. Uh, taking the wheel back from, uh, from Allison, let me ask two quick final things. Sure. You're on the Judiciary Committee. I am. There are rumors you may have another Supreme Court nomination I know. to deal with. What do you think of the, do you have any indication of whether Anthony Kennedy is seriously considering resigning? I don't. Although and, I will say that um, if you were to move anyone onto the Supreme Court who would be adept at conversations with Justice Kennedy, Justice Gorsuch, uh, given his clerkship relationship, um, was, was someone who is likely having those conversations, I don't know. Um, I have no sense of whether or not uh, he will retire. I certainly hope not. Um, I'm someone who thinks his substantive due process analysis and his opinions in Lawrence and in Obergefell significantly advanced civil rights and justice in the United States. I want to ask a final thing. I think many, many people in the room are, are kind of thinking about already, even though it's three and a half years away. What do you think the Democratic Party, is it possible to say even broadly what you would like to see in a Democratic presidential candidate in 2020? Um, I'd like someone um, who's clear-eyed, who's encouraging and uplifting, um, who actually listens um, to Americans of all backgrounds. I'd like someone who's a unifying figure, not someone who um, who tweaks and, and torques and twists grievance in a sense of either victimhood or, um, you know, we've been taken advantage of or this group is ascendant or this group is not. Um, and I think we've got a wide range um, of younger, talented Democrats who um, have run governments at the city, county, and state level, uh, who've served, whether in the Senate or elsewhere. And who knows, we may see folks uh, who've seen success in the private sector. I think predicting who is the right candidate uh, today is, is you know, utterly unwarranted. One interesting word in that adjective, younger. Do you yes. think the party needs, I mean, you have some, you know, you have Bernie Sanders, you have Joe Biden, you have Elizabeth Warren, you have people who are, you know, six, mid-60s plus. Do you think the party needs to make the generational transition in 2020? Um, you know, look, I love Joe Biden. Um, I, I wish he'd run, and I think he's someone who, uh, better than any uh, Democrat I know nationally, uh, connects with and, mm. and engages and, and speaks for. Uh, he's, 
originally from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And if you've never gone to a volunteer fire company or to Ooh. a police department or a union hall with Joe Biden, you haven't yes. lived. It's yes. really something. Yeah. Um, he is one of the most charismatic, engaging people I've ever met. Um, look, this is a, we're a long way off. Yep. Um, I don't think Joe Biden comes across as someone who is disconnected because of how long he's been in national politics. Um, I think he's someone who's inspiring and engaging um, for folks of all backgrounds. Um, but I think that's the kind of spirit we need in a candidate. Uh, we need someone who's optimistic. We need someone who lifts our eyes. We need someone who isn't embarrassing. We need someone who is encouraging and inspiring. And we need someone who can bring us together. We, you know, we could go all night, but I think that's a great note on which to end. Join me in thanking Senator Coons.